months ago, I was playing through Uncharted 4 when I noticed the main character, Nathan Drake, would occasionally reach out to touch the environment around him. What was most impressive was that Drake's hand never clipped through anything, no matter how close to the wall I tried to get him. The game would simply adapt the hand and arm position based on the character's distance from that surface. It looked so natural, and that can be one of the major benefits that result from procedural animation. Let's analyze these procedural environment interactions from Uncharted. We'll see if we can learn anything from a deeper look at these near-perfect animations. Then we'll jump over to our project to try and break down how we can make these interaction animations for our games. Here we have Drake walking around a market that's found in the game. Watch as we have him approach certain pieces of the environment. What stands out to you about this procedural animation? After seeing it a few times, you might notice that despite the animation being procedural and dynamic, there are consistent steps that make up the animation. Let's break them down. Step 1. Drake moves around the environment normally until he comes within a certain distance from an interactable object like a wall. Step 2. As Drake approaches the wall, the procedural animation system is triggered and it begins to override the character's keyframed animations. He raises a hand in the direction of the object, about as high as his waist. Step 3. When Drake is within arm's reach of the wall, the hand is raised to a higher position at about shoulder height, and reaches to touch the wall in the direction that he's moving. Step 4. After a short period of time, the hand position stops moving forward while Drake's body begins to move past it. And that leaves step 5. The procedural hand position moves back to its keyframe position. The overriding procedural animation deactivates and there's a time delay before the whole system can restart. With all 5 steps combined, it makes up the complete animation. However, the interesting thing about this animation cycle is that it is not guaranteed that each step will happen. Ideally, the character will walk by the wall without stopping, and each step of the full animation cycle will be completed. We can consider this to be the best case animation cycle. However, several factors may trigger the character to break from the animation early. Skipping to step 5, which resets the character back to keyframed animations. By experimenting with the game and testing this hypothesis, we'll find the four triggers that reset the animation cycle are as follows. Trigger 1. If the character stops moving. Trigger 2. If the character starts moving further away from the wall and the distance between the character and the surface increases. Trigger 3. If the surface ends and there is nothing left for the character to touch. And Trigger 4. If the angle between the character and the point of contact on the wall no longer makes sense. For example, the arm never reaches across the character's body. Okay, so we have a 5 step cycle for the full procedural interaction animation. We also have a list of triggers that will reset the animation at any point during the cycle. How do we go about programming this relatively complex list of animations? Originally, on my procedural animation livestream, we had started to fit all of the logic and code into a single class, and that might be your first thought as well. But it quickly became clear how overcomplex a single class can and will become. We need a way to break down the animation logic into smaller, more manageable chunks of code. Enter the state pattern and state machines. One of the most popular design patterns in game development, and my personal favorite that has been featured here on iHeartGameDev, the state pattern allows us to separate logic into individual states which contain code only relevant to that state. 
Now look at our animation list. We can consider each step we listed before as its own state. Naming each according to its purpose, we have the search state, the approach state, the rise state, the touch state, and the reset state. Here is a mockup showcasing the full implementation of the state machine model that we'll build together. <laughs> the environment interaction state machine consists of the following classes, abstract classes, the base state, state management class, state manager, and the environment interaction state. The five previously mentioned concrete state classes, a context class, environment interaction context, and a concrete state management class, environment interaction state machine. As we go through and implement each class, we will start to understand how these classes work together to create our procedural animation. And soon enough, we'll have the final result we're looking for, which can play through all five steps of the procedural animation, or correctly reset from any of the cancellation triggers. Dust off your IDE and freshen up on your best practices in programming. Next episode, we start coding. But what did you think of this episode? Did you enjoy the breakdown of a release games mechanic? And is it something that we should do again in the future? Let me know in a comment down below. As always, thank you to all of the patrons for the continued support of the channel. If you would like access to all of my project files, including this procedural animation project, check out the I Heard Game Dev Patreon. And a special shout out to Juke, Terror Dev, Peter Steiner, Ricky Thonglevong, and Rob Malko for the top tier support. But that is all for today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode.